Good evening. Uh, this is the Committee of the Whole. I'm City Council President Nick Mosby, uh, chairing this committee today. Um, we are here to discuss uh, City Council Bill 22-0195, inclusionary housing for Baltimore City uh, in the chambers. Uh, from my right, I have uh, Chairman Conway, Councilman Bullock, Vice President Sharon Green Middleton, Immediately to my left at this point, we have the sponsor of the bill, Councilwoman Odette Ramos. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Councilwoman Felicia Porter, Councilman Zeke Cohen, and Councilman Ryan Dorsey. Uh, in chambers today from Council President's office, we have Aaron DeGraffenwright. Um, from the administration, um, Commissioner Alice Kennedy, could you announce the folks from housing? Uh, good evening, Alice Kennedy, Housing Commissioner. With me this evening is Stacy Freed, uh, Executive Advisor to the Commissioner's Office, and uh, Stephanie Murdoch, our Director of Legislative Liaison Services. Yeah, we're gonna do it next. Thank you, uh, and also I see from the finance, we have Bob Sinemi, uh Mr. Deputy. We have uh, Director Ty Carter from BSIT. We have Nina Themelis, as well as Sophia G. Uh, from the Mayor's Office of Government Relations, and we have Hillary Ruley from the Law Department. I think we are all clear. So um, obviously, uh, I see a lot of folks in the audience that have been keeping uh, up to date and in tune with this bill. Definitely been a lot of council hearings as well as a lot of uh, uh, meetings. Uh, I think at the point of that has been our Councilwoman Odette Ramos uh, really trying to uh, ensure that we get a bill uh, that we all can be proud of. I mean, obviously, inclusionary housing is near and dear and important to all of us who are gathered in this room, uh, but we also want to make sure we don't pass a bill in name only, uh, but a bill that uh, will be effective and efficient as it relates to going uh, to the strategy of uh, developing affordable and inclusive housing in the city of Baltimore. With that said, I'm going to turn it over to our councilwoman, who's the sponsor, uh, to go into some of the latest amendments uh, that we've discussed, as well as uh, go over any additional housekeeping items. Madam uh, Ramos, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, colleagues, for taking the time to be here this evening. Um, I do want to um, introduce uh, Inti, who is our new intern for my office. Um, she's at the Friends School. Whoops. She's at the Fr Inti, who is my new intern. She's at uh, the Friends School. She'll be with us for the month. Um, my staff is doing other 14th District things, so she'll be staffing us uh, this evening. So happy to have her. Um, Mr. President, I just want to uh, take a moment to just uh, go over kind of where we are with this bill um, and then, um, you know, take questions. Uh, the first thing is I did submit uh, a memo um, just to first review where we started and where we are. So we submitted uh, this bill in February of uh, 2022. Um, the original bill uh, had uh, completely redone what um, the, tw the 2007 bill did. The 2007 bill um, was uh, such that uh, we only were able to produce about 34 inclusionary units. Um, it was clear that we needed to do something different um, and that the bill was about to expire um, anyway. So. Um, the uh, uh, previous council had put in a bill to expand for the exp expiration for two years and also have a report uh, that has been uh, completed and uh, was commissioned by DHCD um, and done by the Enterprise Community Partners. Um, that was uh, completed in uh, 2022, of October 2022, so we did wait a while to get that report. Um, and then we have been in negotiations pretty much ever since. Um, this is the fourth uh, work session, well, four, third work session, fourth hearing, um, if you will, um, on the bill. 
Um, we, I want to just first of all thank the administration and the development community and of course the Inclusionary Housing uh, Coalition who's been uh, spending hours and hours and hours on trying to get um, this right because what we want is um, more inclusionary units. The whole goal of inclusionary policy is for us to begin um, tearing away uh, some of the racist housing policies that we've had in our city that were made in this very chamber. Um, and to make sure that we have um, affordability in areas that are typically out of reach. Uh, and so uh, that is the, um, the design here. Um, and I believe that everyone here has that same goal of having more, certainly more than 34 units, um, but significantly more units um, in uh, areas uh, in, in, so to have more affordability. Um, so where we've done, we've been, you'll see um, if you uh, have a copy of the amendments or even my amendment chart, we're actually on version 13 <laughs> uh, because we've had lots of conversations about what makes sense. The bill that we put in in February had, you know, gotten rid of all of the waivers um, and was that you had to do inclusionary units um, even if you weren't getting subsidy. Just, or yeah, not at all. You just had to do inclusionary units. So we were advised by the law department that, of course, we would have to provide some sort of benefit, some sort of subsidy, if that, if the city is making a private entity provide a benefit, which is these inclusionary units. So the first set of amendments really just said, okay, we're going to do this, and we're going to um, ask for get inclusionary units, 10% of the set of the units at 60% of AMI for only those areas that are, those buildings that are getting subsidy. The enterprise report came out and it showed that yes, you can do that, but that in order to make this really work, there would need to be a 15, one five uh, percent um, tax credit. Um, and so ever since we've just been trying to get this right, um, and then uh, I did introduce the tax credit, which we will talk about, um, I guess, in tandem. It's all going to mix up together, but we will have a separate, uh, another hearing today about that. Um, and so where we are is, uh, um, again, a, a set of amendments um, for, to the original bill that brings us a lot closer to what the enterprise report had said and what the department had said and what the um, finance department and also uh, the developers had said. Um, but there still is a couple of places where we don't have agreement. Um, so again, what we uh, have in front of you in terms of the amendments um, and what the bill says is again, any, any development that has um, 20 or more units, and we're just talking rental at this point, um, and is already getting subsidy or planning to apply for subsidy um, have to comply with this bill. Um, and then uh, the development has to have at least 10% of their units available for 60% of AMI, um, which I don't have my chart here, but it's in the bill file as to what amount that, um, that would be. Uh, the bill applies citywide at the moment, um, and that is something that is important to the council to keep going. Um, if DACD has additional subsidy for housing people who are 50% of area median income or below, that uh, then the development would have to do an additional 5%. But that's only if there's subsidy to pay for that um, for that unit in terms of the the rent. Um, so uh, we also have an affirmative marketing. Um, a uh, piece with the inclusionary housing plan that has to be submitted in terms of how the development would market to uh, those least likely to lease in those um, areas. And we've added uh, the original uh, bill, took out the inclusionary board, we have added it back in um, and have uh, narrowed it to five members excuse me, nine members, excuse me. Um, and then the affordability period uh, remains at 30 years. Um, and then just quickly, we want to be very clear that this is a floor and not a ceiling. So if sometime in the future we have another um, uh, TIF before us or a set of subsidy, um, that the, the, there's language in this bill that says we can negotiate higher in terms of number of units, okay? So um, that does not mean that all of those developments would just be limited to the 10%. Um, the, the 
the two, the couple of new things that are in here, and um, I, I'm not going to go through the entire spreadsheet, uh, but the couple of new things are that we've, um, I've agreed to have a um, evaluation period. So instead of having a set, a, a sunset where we would say, you know, after 15 years we're going to start over, and you know, we're going to have a, a, a way of um, of trying to reevaluate. We're going to have a specific evaluation period after five years where our study would be commissioned to kind of see what the impact of inclusionary housing policy is on the market, on number of units, um, that kind of thing, and how much it's costing uh, so that we have um, more to evaluate and see if we need to change things. That doesn't mean that the bill is going to die in five years. That just means that we're building in evaluation to be able to make adjustments um, as needed, um, and we think that a five-year period makes sense um, in order to, to do that. Um, the other piece is a, there's a couple of changes to the inclusionary um, board, and then also that um, one of the uh, pieces that we needed to add was that as income rises, uh, that um, the person would not lose their unit, but that it would be the rent can be adjusted, um, but that once that person has 100% of AMI, they either have to pay market rent and, um, or you know choose uh, another path, and then um, there would be a new unit that comes in to be part of that 10%. Um, so those are really the only changes, uh, Mr. President, in the um, amendments that, that the um, committee has before it. Um, so I just wanted to then outline kind of where we are in our discussions. Um, so uh, the enterprise uh, report was very clear that there needed to be a, um, a 15, one five percent tax credit, which we will um, discuss, and that the, um, the, the inclusionary units, half of which should be for 60 percent of AMI and half of which should be 80 percent of AMI. And that's been a non-starter from um, the, um, the, adver uh, the uh, advocates and also from uh, several council members to try to make sure that this is for 60% um, of AMI. So that is a point of disagreement right now because um, <coughs> finance and uh, the development community and also um, uh, DHCD and the administration want to do this 60% um, of AMI, just 5% of the units at 60% and 5% at, at 80%. My compromise, my proposed compromise was as rents rise, you can change the, um, change the rent amount, or as, as incomes rise, you can change the rent. Um, so that is still something that we need to work out. Um, the other piece that we need to work out is um, whether or not the tax, uh, the credit and the inclusionary policy only applies in certain areas of the city. So the original proposal was through the enterprise report was for core market areas. Um, and then um, the commissioner has uh, agreed to expand to uh, the strong market areas to cover more parts of the city. Um, and then, however, um, it is clear from talking with colleagues and also talking with um, advocates that um, it is necessary to have this be citywide as an opportunity uh, for affordability. And then the last point of contention at the moment is uh, has to do with the tax credit, which we'll get into um, later on, but just to sort of round this out, is that the, um, the tax credit um, does a proposal to, to cap it at a certain amount, and we would get a certain amount of units for just that amount. Um, and uh, there's... Uh, I would oppose that um, also because um, we're not capping any of our tax, other tax credits right now. Um, we definitely need to go through a reform of our other tax credits. Um, but we, and acknowledging that, you know, obviously our budget is tenuous right now, uh, but that, you know, it doesn't uh, make sense to, you know, cap one thing if we're not doing the others. Uh, but also we want to make sure that we're getting um, the units that we need. So that's kind of where we are, and I'm happy to take questions. And um, Mr. President, I don't know if you want to have uh, the commissioner or Department of Finance talk. We are going to have a, a 
everybody will give their bill reports for the tax credit hearing. Um, so I uh, didn't know how you wanted to move in that direction. No, thank you. At this time, I, I would like uh, to provide agencies or the administration an opportunity to um, um, express any thoughts, feelings, concerns, questions. Uh, I know that there are some um, really strong opinions on a couple different issues that uh, the councilwoman has outlined for us. Uh, but at this time, do you guys want to say anything? If not, it's it's okay. You don't have to, you're not forced to say anything, but just want to give yeah. you the opportunity. We we were going to share our comments in the on the tax credit or yeah, yeah. so bill report. Again, okay. from a housekeeping perspective, right now we're covering City Council Bill 22-0195, inclusionary housing. Uh, you know, there's a a couple different um, pressure points in that particular bill. Uh, we're going to move to um, the other bill, 23-0369. Uh, at that time, we're going to open it up for public testimony, but we wanted the opportunity to make sure that everyone had the opportunity to speak on behalf of this bill if they would like to. So I'm, he I'm not hearing anything, I guess, from uh, members of the council. We've also been joined by uh, Chairman uh, Costello uh, to my right. Um, at this time, are there any um, additional questions or concerns from members of the council regarding this particular bill? Okay, hearing and seeing none, we're going to adjourn on City Council Bill 22-0195, uh, inclusionary, inclusionary housing uh, for Baltimore City. The next bill, we're going to go to City Council Bill 23-0369, High Performance Inclusionary Housing and Tax Credit. Uh, obviously, this is a companion bill uh, with the main bill that we just talked about. Uh, this is a way to ensure uh, that the numbers uh, kind of worked out. Uh, again, this was introduced by Councilwoman Odette Ramos. At this time, we're going to allow Councilman uh, Ramos to go over the bill and where we are with the bill. Uh, then we're going to uh, turn it over to agencies as we have some agency reports in. Uh, and then we're going to go to questions and concerns uh, from members of the council to the agencies. Uh, and then we'll turn to the public for public testimony. Uh, so with that, uh, Madam Councilwoman, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. President. And again, thank you, colleagues, for taking the time this evening to be here. Um, and thanks to so many supporters. Um, this bill does come out of the discussions that we were having. Um, uh, initially, I was very resistant to doing a tax credit and still kind of am, just given the fact that we do have a good portion of our budget that is uh, for tax credits um, in um, uh, for larger developments, um, but it was clear from the various discussions that we needed some way um, to make sure that the um, the tax credit that uh, these units um, were actually going to get built. Um, and so the uh, recommendation from the enterprise uh, report was a 15.15 <coughs> tax credit. It was for 10 years. I have in the bill 15. Um, and uh, the idea being that, again, what we're saying here is for um, these developments that they uh, were not going to be taking market rent, right? So there's a difference, there's a gap between the market rent that they would get and the rent that a 60% of AMI family would pay, which is about um, $1,700 given the, DH, the Maryland DHCD sub, um, uh, report. Um, on um, affordable uh, affordable uh, rents. And so um, what this does is it, uh, well, first of all, generally, the um, council does not have authority to just create tax credits. We can't just dream them up and, send, and put them in um, legislation. We have to have authority from the General Assembly. And so what we decided to do, rather than go for an, a separate tax credit from the General Assembly, is utilize the very broad authority that we have uh, from the high performance um, category of tax credits. And this is state law that allows for uh, Baltimore City to incentivize building high performance buildings, which are green buildings basically, um, by providing tax credits. And it's very broad. That's basically what the state law says. And so this um, a previous council to us and then this council when we came 
um, extended it, we do have the high performance market rate tax credit. We have the high performance new construction tax credit and the high performance targeted tax credit. And so what this bill does is it utilizes that authority to create the high performance inclusionary housing tax credit. Um, and we have in the bill that it can be coupled with any other subsidy. Um, and uh, so it would be applied for, or, you know, given just like the regular um, uh, in, uh, high performance tax credits would normally be. Uh, and uh, that would be, again, tied to the inclusionary housing bill so that uh, the buildings that would be getting and required to do um, inclusionary would also uh, be able to take advantage of this credit. So that is uh, what we have here. I do not have. Um, amendments at this time because we are still in discussions um, about uh, how to format the credit, um, whether we expand it, whether we cap it, whether we do other things with it. But um, I will say that, again, the point of contention um, in this particular legislation is, um, A, again, geographic. Uh, where does this apply? If we apply the occlusionary bill to citywide, then the credit would be citywide. Um, and also uh, the idea that, you know, again, I get our, our financial position at the moment, um, given the Kerwin, um, you know, uh, money that we are putting into the schools. Um, but we also want to prioritize housing. It's extremely important. And so, um, again, we should be treating this credit just like any other credit, but also still go into reforming our tax credits and put this also on the table. So I would be opposed to um, caps. Um, and um, so I'm looking forward to hearing the discussion um, from my colleagues and uh, from uh, and then uh, from the public. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. Uh, we're going to turn it over to agency reports now. The first up, the law department. Thank you, Mr. Council President. The law department approves the bill for form and legal sufficiency. Thank you, uh, Madam Esquire. Next, uh, Department of Planning. We don't have anyone here from planning, but there's no objection to FERS. Nina, would you like to talk on behalf of planning? That is correct. Yeah, Nina Themelis, uh, Mayor's Office of Government Relations, the Department of Planning defers to the Department of Finance on this piece of legislation. Thank you, Nina. Um, next up, Department of Finance, take us away. Hi, good evening, Bob Senemi. Uh, representing the Department of Finance, and uh, we have you know, quite a few comments we wanted to go over to help folks understand uh, uh, our position and, and where we see this bill. So, um, you know, first on the background, these two bills, the inclusionary housing bill and then this tax credit bill, they are meant to work together. They are meant to be companion bills. So, you know, they, they really have to thread a pretty tight needle to make sure they both work. If we get something wrong on either side, um, it will create problems, which I'll, I'll get into. Um, the current state, as we see it, is the inclusionary bill that uh, Councilwoman Ramos introduced and talked about previously. Uh, there are still some significant differences between that bill and what the Enterprise uh, report recommended. Enterprise is a subject matter expert on this topic. Um, they had recommendations, and this bill is still you know, very different from what they recommended on you know, things like the AMI, uh, the geography, and the tax credit terms. So the way we see this tax credit bill, again, in conjunction with the current inclusionary housing bill that's in front of us, is there are, there are three issues that raise um, concerns for us. And again, when we're, when we're when our bill is so different from the enterprise report, uh, it raises these concerns for us. One is just the potential for lost revenue. So the, the enterprise report is very clear that the, the city market can only bear this in what they call core market areas. And that's a pretty limited part of the city, really, uh, when you look at the map from the enterprise uh, uh, study. And what the companion bill does, or what the tax credit bill does, is it would extend um, the inclusionary requirements citywide. And the reason we have concerns with that is that if the report is saying that the market can't bear this, and again, it was an objective look at the market, um, we do have the real potential of losing revenue, tax revenue, uh, from losing projects. And we tried, made an attempt to model this out. Uh, we know that looking at the history of the high performance market rate tax credit, which is basically synonymous with multifamily housing projects, 
um, you know, give or take one or two here and there. We've had volume as high as nine projects come online per year. We've had as low as one. The last few years, we've, we've averaged six coming online each year. And of those six, and we, we show this in the, in the report, of those six, two are in the core markets, and those are the ones that the enterprise says they could absorb a small you know, inclusionary requirement. But there are four per year uh, that are happening in what we call strong submarkets, which are outside of that core. And I think those would be at risk under this uh, legislation as it stands today. Um, I did the math on what that would mean in terms of lost revenue. It's in our bill report. Uh, basically, if you look at those four projects, on average, they bring $16.9 million of assessed uh, uh, property, property value onto our books each year for one project. Um, so you multiply that by four, you're talking $70 million or so uh, of tax revenue. And um, the, the, the actual tax revenue that was lost uh, from missing out on those developments, it's, it's small in the first few years because those projects come with a tax credit. But as the tax credits burn off, you're losing uh, a significant amount of tax revenue to the city's books. And again, this is just based on what the enterprise report says. The enterprise report very clearly says you cannot bear this in the strong submarkets. Uh, in our report, we show what that impact would be. It starts at 300,000 per year of lost revenue. It grows and grows as you lose additional projects. Uh, by year 15, you're at nearly $7 million of lost property tax revenue uh, for a total of $55.8 million over, over those 15 years. So that is a, a risk. Uh, I should say, you know, these are all projections based on, you know, what we're looking at in the market. It could be worse. It could be worse. I mean, right now, interest rates have grown, right? Construction costs have gotten higher. Something that the enterprise report said was feasible even just two or three years ago can become infeasible very quickly. So I think we just have to be, you know, mindful of the risk we're put, we would put our housing market through if we were to lose uh, projects on that like that. So that's one of the issues is the potential for lost revenue. On the other side, Let's assume for a moment that the market can bear this. Okay, so let's, improve, let's assume for a moment the optimistic scenario, which admittedly I'm not usually very good at <laughs> in my role. I'm usually thinking of the, the downside. But in an optimistic scenario, let's say that these developments continue to occur um, and we pick up, the city picks up the cost of this new tax credit. I've also modeled out what that would look like. Again, if you, if you assume that there are about six projects on average coming online a year, in the current bill that's in front of us, uh, you know, coupled with the inclusionary requirement, you would have six projects that co would come online per year, and all of them would get a tax credit in order to meet the uh, in order to meet the terms to make sure that we could cover the cost for the owners of those buildings uh, by bringing those units on below market rent. And looking at the tax credit that's in front of us as well, the 15-year, 15% uh, 15 tax credit, you can see also in the bill report. That would be an additional cost to the city that would grow over time. Uh, it would start at about $600,000 per year, uh, and you'd be adding additional project subsidy cost on top of that every year. And this is a really critical point, I think, is that when you subsidize a project in the first year, you can't pull that away in year two or year seven or year 10. You would be just totally, you know, you, you, would, you would create a significant hardship for the owner. If they got a credit to help subsidize the lower rent and they're required to do that for a long period of time, you can't just yank that away. So whatever you prove as a tax credit in the first year lives for 15 years. Then you add another layer the next year. You're going to have another six projects or whatever the average is come online. The next year, you're going to add more. You're going to add more. You're going to add more. And if you look at the cost, that's why it kind of becomes like a staircase where you just have a growing cost over time for, for a program like this. We're estimating that, again, if we stick to current volume that we're seeing, which is about six projects per year, uh, we would start with about a $600,000 cost in year one, and it would essentially more than double each year as you're bringing more uh, projects online, uh, growing to almost a $15 million cost by year 15 uh, for a total of $102.5 million over that 15-year period. You know, one thing that's, again, critically important to understand about this tax credit and how it's different than others is this is all cost. We're not getting any new revenue with this particular inclusionary housing tax credit. Any other tax credit, you're, you're, you're providing a subsidy, but there's net revenue that comes into the city uh, with those programs. So if we offer the high performance market rate tax credit, the one that this one is modeled after, that's an 80% subsidy in the first year. So we at least get a 20% of the increased assessed value as tax revenue. We have other tax credits that are 50% in year one. They all come with some net revenue. 
And we can argue back and forth about do we have the right subsidy? And I would say in some cases I don't think we have the right subsidy on those other tax credits. But that's all really neither here nor there because for this program it is all cost. It's all cost. It's guaranteed cost in the budget. And it's just a matter of how quickly the development happens uh, and how quickly that cost escalates over time. Uh, the third point I'll make on the cost, and, and Councilwoman, you alluded to this. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, we, we just received word. Uh, could you speak up a little bit? The folks in the back are saying that they're having a hard time here. Oh, sure. Sorry about that. Um, the, the third concern we have on, on this bill is the, just the budget context of what we're facing right now. So as I know many council members have been briefed on this, we had a real um, uh, a, a big surprise in the fiscal 24 budget that our cost on schools, our required co uh, cost on schools grew significantly, uh, dramatically in the fiscal 24 budget. This was beyond what had been estimated uh, at the state level for their original projections of what we would have to contribute. There was a weird quirk in the formula where we went off of a little bit of a cliff, frankly, of getting state aid that was expected for a long period of time. And now we're on the hook uh, uh, for these additional costs. We have not given up on trying to get that fixed. Um, you know, the mayor has said himself that he wants to look at this issue and go back to the state and see if we can help get some relief on that, uh, on that cost, but that is uncertain at this point. That will take a lot of action um, um, potentially at the state level. And so the context I'm looking at facing this bill is that our fiscal 24 budget is not sustainably balanced for the first time in over 15 years. Uh, we're relying on $30 million of one-time resources to balance the fiscal 24 budget. If we don't get uh, relief in next year's General Assembly uh, through these formulas, you know, we will have to come back potentially and say, we've got to live with this and we have, we'll be looking at making cuts in the budget. And in that context, I would never want to add a program like this where you have a growing and growing cost over a long period of time. Um, we do think that there is a world in which this package can live together and we can do it on a more modest scale. And I'll give you some of the ideas for, for what that would look like. Um, one of them is, is a cap. So I don't feel comfortable, you know, we don't feel comfortable at this point, again, having this growing cost. But if we were to build in a cap and say, look, after three years or five years, or, or we could pick a dollar amount, that we pause and say we cannot go past that cost cap, that would at least give us time to say, to have an automatic stabilizer built into the bill where we stop. Even if we have a, a review commission or something that comes back in five years, those costs are gonna continue to grow and grow and grow if we don't stop it. So we would feel more comfortable if with this bill, this package, we had an automatic stopping point, which would mean we pause, we look at our budget context, maybe we got the school's issue fixed, maybe things are looking good and we're like, okay, we can extend the cap and continue to do more of these, uh, these projects and try to get more inclusionary units. But we feel pretty strongly that that is just a common sense provision given where we are budget, budget wise. If you combine a cap with some of the other uh, components, you can, can have a bill that works. So one example that we, we put forward was, if you have a cap at $2 million on the tax credit, that's annual, that's not total, so it would take a couple years to get to that cap, and you do core plus strong market areas, uh, and you set the income levels like we had wanted to at 60% and 80%, not 60% alone, uh, and you keep the affordability period to match the tax credit. You have a 30-year affordability period and only a 15-year tax credit. When the tax credit expires, the owner still has the responsibility for keeping those units below market rate, but with no subsidy. So you really put a hardship on that owner uh, to try to continue that over a longer period of time. So we feel that the affordability term in the original inclusionary bill should max the tax credit. So let's call that 15 years. Um, if you do that and you run the numbers, you will get inclusionary units. If it works for the development community, and it works in a way that they are not you know, irreparably harmed, you do get uh, units built. My fear is that in this particular bill, if you throw this out there and pass it, if it doesn't work for the development community, they'll stop building, and then we don't get any units or an unknown number of units. If we do it in a way that's all connected, um, that all ties together, where all parties, you know, the development community says, we can do this with the subsidy that you have. Uh, if the city is protected on the cost side, we will produce units over the first few years of this bill and then have a chance to pause when we get to the cap and say, okay, is this working, is it not working? Are things happening slower than we anticipated or faster? Have there been impacts on the housing market, right? It's, you know, you know if you have something stuck in law uh, and there are 
impacts on the housing market, you know, it's, it's not an easy process to come back and change the law. It takes months to go through uh, and, and, and get that change. So having some kind of built-in stopping point, we think, you know, just makes sense with this kind of legislation. Um, I'll, I'll mention one uh, final po point on the, on, on the technical component of this. So the tax credit itself, the 15-year, 15% 15 um, tax credit that was proposed, we would like to take a crack at rewriting that um, because the, the tax credit was written based on an old high performance market rate tax credit that has since expired. So without boring folks with all the details, there used to be a targeted tax credit that was 15 years. That one has since expired. We have language now around the high performance market rate tax credit, uh, which this was modeled after, but there's one that's active that we would want to write the language around to get the calculations right, the definitions right, and the terms right. Uh, we put some of our comments in the bill report, but we would like a chance to either amend the current bill or just work from that baseline uh, of the one that's active rather than the one that is expired. Uh, we would also say that there is time to develop a new um, application system for, for folks to apply for this new tax credit, and, you know, BSIT is going to talk a little bit about that. You know, that takes months. You know, we've seen that take as long as six or seven months, and then finance has to uh, test the system so that applicants can get in and make sure that they can submit everything. So there is some programming uh, and testing that has to happen there. So on a technical standpoint, we think there's, you know, a lot of room for improvement of the actual tax credit itself, how we structure it. Um, and we'll need some time to do that. So we would ask for an enactment date that would be um, at least six to nine months in advance to give us the chance to, uh, to get all that complete. Um, so in closing, I would just say that the current bill, I see it as written. It's a lose-lose proposition for the city. If the market gets hurt by this bill, we lose property tax revenue. If the market does better than expected, we end up picking up the cost of the subsidy to make sure we're subsidizing this, this growing cost. Um, I've laid out a, a scenario here where I think we can um, get something that works and we would have the outcome of actually getting units produced in, in concert with you know, the market because we need the market to work and build new units in order to get inclusionary units built. If we, if we stop the market, we'll get no units or very few more uh, units with this bill. Um, so uh, again, that's in closing my comments. This all needs to fit together very carefully, so we'd ask you to consider those points as, as you look at this bill, and I'm happy to take any questions from the, uh, uh, from the committee tonight. Thank you, Bob. At this time, are there any questions from the council too? First, we're gonna to turn to sponsor of the bill, uh, Councilman Ramos, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, thank you, Mr. Sename, for your um, deep dive on this. I really appreciate all the time that you've spent I have a question about the concept of the of the sort of um, cap and stopping point. One of the um, issues with that would be that you know if we've already got people in units and we're not, so I don't know how you see that happening. Where if we've already got people in units, and then we stop, then that would affect those people in the units. One of the things that we're trying to avoid is having that kind of cliff effect. I, I wouldn't see it that way. What I would see is there would be projects as they come online that would, you know, have these requirements. Those folks would apply for and qualify for the tax credit, and then that would guarantee that owner of having that tax credit for a 15-year period. So they would have that subsidy for the full term of affordability if it matched the tax credit um, to make sure that they could continue to hold those units at an affordable level. So the way we see the cap is that once we would hit the cap, that's a, a chance for us to pause and then see if we can add more money or change that uh, language. But those units that already applied and went in through the law and had the tax credit, they would continue, th those units would continue to stay affordable for the full term of the, in our proposal, for the full term of the tax credit, which we think is a significant improvement. I mean, 15 years. Uh, on a tax credit, that's a long time to hold a unit like that, uh, you know, affordable. And that's a, I think that's a vast improvement over what we're seeing today where we're getting virtually nothing uh, uh, built with that law. So I, we see it as if you qualify for the tax credit and you, and you live with the uh, terms of that law, you can hold those units affordable. You will be held to that through the law and the financial subsidy will be there to help you do that over a pretty long time period uh, over that 15 year period. And um, have you, uh, uh, we asked you to do this yesterday, so if you don't have it, that's fine, um, figured out um, the number of units that you think with your proposal that we would be producing? We, yeah, we, we did. I did, um, 
some calculations on that. I did not include it in, in the bill report, but um, just for perspective, um, I looked at the, basically what I looked at was, again, using this average of about six per year, the ones that happen to have been built in the core areas have been bigger. They have more units. I, you know, I don't know if that's kind of a quirk of the market right now, but they just happen to have been these really, really large projects. The ones in the strong markets tended to be a little bit smaller. Um, so when we did the math on how long it would take us to hit a cap, by that point, I was estimating that we would have, over a five-year period, we would get um, basically 250 units built. Again, that's based on current volumes, which means you built, um, you know, you have 2,500 units coming online overall because the market continues to uh, uh, function as it did before, and that you get 10% of those at affordable levels, you know, half at 60, half at 80%, so you get about 250. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm happy to share those assumptions in more detail with folks and kind of model it out. I have a spreadsheet that kind of shows how that would work. It's based on um, current volumes that we're seeing and the size of the units that we have coming on in the multifamily market. So um, could it be a little bit less or a little bit more than that? Yes, it's possible. Um, but I think that's a reasonable number of units to get. And, you know, the way I think of that is, okay, we've talked a lot about how we only got 30-something units over 15 years. We could have 250 in five years or four years potentially with a bill that fits together and, and makes sense. But as the current bill is that stands in front of the council, I don't think we would get that because I think we would have, you know, some developers walk away and say we just can't make this work because the subsidy is not enough to cover that, those, those income levels at the full 60% discount. Um, Mr. President, I'm happy to yield to my colleagues. Um, Thank you. I have other questions, but I can yield. Okay, we'll circle back. Uh, before we go into additional questions, I would like to acknowledge the presence of uh, Councilman uh, Tony Glover, uh, as well as Councilman uh, James Torrance and the Deputy Councilman from the 7th District uh, has joined us today. Um, uh, before we turn into questions, real quick, uh, Bob, uh, I guess historically, based off of the um, high performance tax credits, has it, have we seen an increase of new residents uh, and an increase of new income as it relates to income tax? So it's, it's really hard to say for sure, um, just because we don't necessarily survey people in those buildings. Um, we do know that, <clears throat> excuse me, we do know that our income tax distribution has gotten uh, better at the higher income levels. Um, and I don't necessarily well, depending know- depending on those, who you're talking to, I mean. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I don't know if those things are necessarily related to those high buildings. Performance. Yeah, to the high performance. But I guess from a projection perspective, uh, I guess when we look, you know, two years, three years, five years out, the expectation is we're going to cons consistently see uh, a sustainable increase in income taxes in the city? I, I think so, if the pace continues, again, at the same rate. And, you know, we've seen a lot of these units come online. Um, you know, over time, it's it's you know, possible that situation shifts and we see, you know, shifts in the market. But generally, like, there's older buildings that kind of become, you know, more obsolete and there's new ones that come online. So I think it's reasonable to expect that there would still be more, you know, building in this market. There's still room to grow with these multifamily, you know, apartment complexes. But the relationship between the income and those units is hard you to know. You can't directly sure. correlate. I can't directly correlate because we, unless we were to go and survey people and say, did you come from outside of Baltimore or what's your income level, which I know some of the developers have tried to do, have tried to get at least some anecdotal evidence of where people are coming from, but we don't know that for well, sure. Well, with this bill, if we go down the path of doing income verification, uh, we would naturally have that information. Uh, that's, that's true. We would have to do that for that. So I think that's another positive about um, understanding on the population growth. Uh, with that, um, do we have any questions for members of the council? Mr. Chair, the floor is yours. Thank you, Bob. I appreciate the the very thorough uh, breakdown. I, would, I was kind of going through your report. Um, you, you you made two recommendations to try to fix it um, that I thought were interesting, and you, you mentioned the cost cap. Have you thought much about what that cost cap would look like and how it would function if we did consider something like that? <clears throat> Yes, thank you. So we, we have thought a little bit about that. Um, our team is working on just language kind of going through scenarios like what would that look like because it is a little bit different from what we have in our other tax credits. But the way we see it is um, 
you know, we receive applications for the high performance market rate tax credit. Sometimes they're well in advance of when the project's actually done. You know, we don't necessarily have the, we don't know what the post assessment value is. The tax credit is based on looking at the pre improvement value versus the post improvement value. Um, so we would have to design some language to say, when is it that we actually hit this cap? Um, would it be after the first project that kind of breaches the cap, so to speak, that gets the credit that b b brings us over that cap? We would never want a project, you know, again, we don't want to have a situation where we have a project that qualifies under the inclusionary law and that doesn't get the subsidy or vice versa. So we'd have to think about a way to make sure that would get hit. But it can be as simple as to say the cost of this credit cannot exceed $2 million, and when you bump up, up or $5 million or whatever the number is, and whenever you bump up against that, you say um, we've got to pause the law basically to look at it and see if we want to add more money to the, to the program. So it would look something like that. It would have to be consistent, managed with the application process, again, because the timing on these is many projects, not all, but many projects we get um, applying for the high performance market rate tax credit, not this inclusionary one we're talking about, but just the high performance market rate, you know, sometime earlier in the process when it's even just in kind of the design concept. Uh, there are people that apply that drop out because they decide not to do the project and those go away. So we, you know, we keep in touch with the applicants to kind of see what's going on. Um, but we're working on some language that I think could, could, could do that in a way that's meaningful that all parties would know, you know, where we are at any given time. And again, uh, if uh, folks could speak directly into the mic as well as uh, project your volume as much as possible. I think we ha are still having some issues in the back um, for hearing. Um, there are a couple seats in the front uh, if folks uh, would like to move up uh, if you cannot hear. Uh, Mr. Chair, the floor is still yours. Um, sure, thank you. And then um, in reference to the other suggestion that you guys had, and maybe this is a question for HCD. Um, you guys distributed a map in advance, uh, and the other suggestion coming out of finance was regarding um, the geography of the impact of the bill. Um, if you could just maybe talk us a little bit about what that means and if this is intended to align with that suggestion. Uh, yes, yeah, so um, the Areas outlined in blue on the handout are what um, would be defined as the core markets, and those are the markets that um, were outlined in you know, the enterprise report as um, the focus. The areas outlined in green are the strong markets, um, so that is in terms of um, having the conversations of looking to expand um, from the core markets to the strong markets, but not uh, citywide. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Are there any additional questions? Concerns? I um, see the hand raise of uh, Councilwoman uh, Felicia Porter. The floor Thank is yours. Thank you. Um, Director Sinemay, I know it was a follow up from the last hearing about having some sort of economic modeling presented during this session. Do we have some like real numbers that we could really discuss and kind of look, look at during this time? Or? So, um, so I, I mean, the numbers I brought on the lost revenue and the volume is, is um, you know, what we came back with. So if there's something more we can do beyond that, I'm happy to pull something more for you. We looked, I looked at every project that's ever qualified for the high performance market rate tax credit, the, the pre and post assessed value and the uh, number of units that were created. Because there has been a trend, there was like very few in the first couple years, then there was a big spike and then it's kind of leveled off at, like I said, about six per year. That's what we use for our projections going forward. If what you're asking is more on like the impact on the housing market, I think that's a little bit more, um, some of those answers might be in the enterprise um, report that get a little, and, and you know, that enterprise was asked to do a study of ju you know, just the Baltimore market because our market is unique, of course, compared to some other um, you know, localities that have tried a policy like this. So we were thinking more about the cost and the potential lost impact to the city, but the impacts on the market, um, we can either follow up on that or some of it might have been answered in that report. Yeah, and let me rephrase my question because I, I want to make sure that I have a clear understanding. I, I believe the councilwoman or it was the council president had asked for like economic modeling with actual market rent rates to see how the projections go. So like to show it in real time during the hearing, um, that's, pre that's precisely what I'm asking for. Okay, so I don't have anything that dynamic, okay. so to speak, but um, you know, again, happy to talk afterwards if you want to see different scenarios of if, you know, because, you know, even with the idea of the cap, like you could hit it 
sooner. You could hit it later. Just, in, it just you know, it, it just depends on how quickly uh, development happens. It's impossible to predict exactly what's going on. I mean, we have a good understanding of what's in the pipeline, but like I said earlier, sometimes projects drop off or they don't get financing or whatever it might be, and they, they drop off. So we could show slower or more aggressive, you know, scenarios of how long it would take or, or how long it would take to hit that those yeah. benchmarks. Thank you. Uh, uh, Councilman uh, Cohen? I'm also interested in kind of the, the, the counterfactual of what not doing anything would cost, because it seems like we've spent a bunch of years not um, doing any kind of inclusionary, not creating truly affordable housing. Um, and, and as a result, I think we're losing population and folks are making the choice with their feet and their dollars to go to Baltimore County or some other place where tax rate is less high. And so I wonder, as we're thinking about sort of the, you know, some of the numbers you mentioned, 600,000 in the first year, um, and then this kind of escalator, just what we're losing in lack of tax revenue from not having like a market around affordable housing, because that seems to be a gap in our current marketplace. And it does seem like between the enterprise and the 15%, I don't see a cause for why developers wouldn't want to build if they're getting those additional subsidies. Does that make sense? Yeah, that, that does. That's, that's, that's a very interesting point. I think um, you know, what, what we would say is you have, to, you have to treat this in a way that units get built to have the impact. So yeah, there could be somebody that decided to move to the county or some, you know, someplace outside of Baltimore City that if they would have had access to one of these units that we're talking about could have moved there and stayed, but that only happens if the, if the units get produced. So, um, you know, our, our thinking is if we don't do this in a way that's kind of mindful of the market realities, uh, that it won't work. I mean, the Enterprise Report did say basically what you're saying is that at the top end of the market, we can absorb a little of this with a small cost because that market is very strong, rents are very high, you know, people, there's a lot of demand to build in some of those areas. Um, but, you know, in the current bill at 60% AMI, the numbers that we've looked at, the, 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 the tax credit doesn't cover the lost revenue. And that's an issue for, and again, that's something that Enterprise said, that the development community has run numbers have said, we've run numbers and said. So yeah, again, these pieces all have to be connected in order to keep the market functioning so that actual units get built, which means that we get inclusionary units out of those new, those new units. So I think that's more of a reason to say, we've got to do it in the right way so that things continue to get built. Even if we're saying that a developer is able to get whatever the initial subsidy is, whether that's you know enterprise chap, whatever the case may be, plus 15% more, just to do this 10% at the lower rate, we're saying at that point they still wouldn't be able to build. I mean that to me seems a bit of a stretch. Yeah, I mean the the, the enterprise report says that outside of the core, the market can't bear it. Um, the the, we've run some numbers independently too, and we've come to the conclusion that at a 60-80 at a split for 10% of the units, 5% of the units at 60% AMI, and 5% at 80% AMI, that we can do it with the existing tax credit, the one that's in front of you tonight, but if it's 60% only, 
uh, there's still a gap and it doesn't cover the cost. So that's where we get into the, um, the, the place where we get nervous about, we could just have projects, folks just walk away and say, I can't make it work under this, under this law. Just, um, Councilman, I would, would step in to also just talk in general about the affordable housing um, landscape um, in, in general. So we know that we need affordable housing units within the city of Baltimore. So we are undertaking, um, we're team, we're evaluating the RFP right now for our first, um, the city's first actual comprehensive housing plan uh, to build off of the state's housing needs assessment to look at exactly how many units do we need of affordable housing at which uh, AMI, AMI percentages, et cetera. Um, and I just, you know, would say that for the purposes of inclusionary, the inclusionary units are affordable units to create opportunity where that opportunity would not normally exist. Um, we do have other forms of supporting uh, the creation of affordable units where in one project, um, we might, you know, put in 500,000 or a million dollars and get 93 units of affordable housing or 120 units of affordable housing in that one project, um, leveraging a significant number, sometimes as many as 26 other funding sources to get to that capital stack to get that project over the finish line. So um, I think that it's just also looking at making that distinction between the overall kind of intent of the inclusionary, which is to create opportunity uh, where opportunity would not exist. Um, and then also looking at the greater need that we have and the other tools in the toolbox that we're using to address the larger creation of affordable units that we need in the city. No, and I appreciate that you all are undertaking that review. I think it is badly needed. Um, and. I also appreciate some of the work that I've seen in Greenmount West and other parts of the city where we're sort of going with re <laughs> Rebuild Metro and other groups going block by block and building affordable housing. And there's not enough, clearly. I mean, you know, so I think the more tools in our toolbox, the more we can sort of bring to this, I think is really important so that we don't continue to hemorrhage population from that, um, you know, not wealthy but not uh you know working 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 class folks that are rapidly leaving our city um thank you commissioner and thank you bob and thank you mr president thank you any additional questions any additional questions uh councilman glover thank you mr president um so in my district district 13 you know you and i had many uh conversations in the past about uh, affordable housing and things of that nature um I just feel that um, at times when there are developers that want to uh, develop in my community, um, which is a very low poverty community, I feel like we gotta go through hurdles to try to get those developers, uh, those minority developers to develop in our community. I, I, I don't trust, you know, DHCD. Um, I don't trust you guys at all. I think that um, the process is made to where um, those that have already been um, getting those fundings and those developers that have been getting those projects in the past, I feel like those are the developers that are getting the projects as we see today. Um, I think at times the uh, RP is made out to where um, the paperwork is probably written for developers that have had uh, maybe uh, four, five developments that have taken place in Baltimore as opposed to uh, one or two um, developers that have done one or two projects in the community. So I think the paperwork is written for those that have done those five to continue to get those projects, which I believe is unfair. If, um, if that's not the practice, then I apologize. But a lot of times um, from conversations that I've heard, had with other developers, this is what we see. Um, I don't really understand what inclusionary housing uh, mean because I don't see minority developers taking advantage or giving the opportunity to develop our neighborhoods. Um, it's basically um, what it is that you want and maybe what the administration want as opposed to what the community want and what the community needs. I represent a district that wants 
affordable housing. They want to be able to own their homes. They want to be able to have those legacy residents not leave, not get bought up, not get sold out. And I just feel that um, we're, we're being overlooked. So we know we're not Canton, no, we're not Rolling Park, but we're East Baltimore. And we have a quality, a life that we would like to see come over to our part of the district where residents that want to call Baltimore their home remain in their homes. So what I'm asking is that, that we open it up to abroad to make it uh, available for minority contractors to be able to bid on these contracts. Or if we make a proposal as a council person, because we're listening to the voices of our community, and we propose something to you guys to give it a deeper dive and look into what it is that we're proposing from our community, but this is what the community is asking for, as opposed to at times with uh, the administration wants to see. We're where the rubber meets the road. We have these conversations every day with our community. So again, I'm asking that you give an opportunity to those minority developers that want to build in our community, that want to have a stake in our community to get those opportunities. Thank you. Are there any additional questions or comments? Uh, we're going to go back to the bill sponsor, Councilwoman Ramos. Thank you very much, um, Mr. President. Um, a question about, um, in your bill report, Mr. Sentiment, you talked about that there's a, a risk of losing 16.9 million. Well, so the value that each of these developments have, which is the assessed value, is about 16.9 million per property. Um, and then you go into, if we lose that, uh, the amount that we may, um, in property tax revenues that we may lose. Does your um, analysis factor in the fact that they're already getting tax credits? Um, so, and the fact that we're not getting revenue already? So it, it factors in on the lost revenue, it factors in that for those projects, the assumption is they would be getting the high performance market rate tax credit, um, which is 80% through the first five years, and then it declines over time down to 30%. Um, so it does factor that in. Uh, and so the numbers are, you know, more concerned, I guess they're lower in the first few years because it's factoring it in that the net revenue is less in those early years. But then once the tax credit burns off, you're getting after year 10 you're getting the full value of that of that property so that's included in this in that, this that is yeah that was factored into the lost revenue that they're only that we're only losing the 20 percent in the first five years and then the number grows as the tax credit burns off mm -hmm. yeah and it doesn't but it, yeah your analysis doesn't include the 15 percent here it's just as no right no yeah on the subsidy cost that's where we're saying the cost of the tax credit, that's where we're saying that. But on the lost revenue, we're assuming mm -hmm. that the projects are, that are lost, if we do lose them because of um, you know, requirements that are too, too tight that the market can't bear, they would never qualify for the subsidy because they wouldn't be built, presumably, in the first place. Yeah, um, I appreciate that. I guess um, I uh, realize that we need all the tools in the toolbox for um, affordable, but we also need all the tools to be able to increase our tax base. And I don't think that that providing um, all of these uh, tax credits and relying on this type of development to increase our tax base is the way to go, right? I mean, as we've talked about, um, really uh, making sure that we're addressing vacant properties and rehabbing vacant properties so that we can get tax base and more people um, moving into the city, uh, renters becoming homeowners, is, is really where we're gonna get our tax base, um, not necessarily this. Um, so, um, certainly, that's a significant number that you have in your um, in your report. Um, but I would posit that um, you know we've got to make some significant investments in our neighborhoods um, in order to increase tax base. And that um, the you know obviously you've got your it's your job to worry about every dollar. Um, so, uh, but I I'm not sure that you know relying on just uh, these types of developments to grow our city and to have a tax base is is the way to go, right? I just, I definitely, definitely think and we've talked about this that we've got to make investments in our neighborhoods. As my colleague from East Baltimore was saying, um, that you know we've got to make those investments. So um, just to sort of um, you know say that that the certainly this is uh, Im important um, to factor in, but the fact is that we're actually losing tax base 
we're actually losing money. We're, well, on the vacant properties, we're losing $100 million a year for, on maintenance and $100 million a year on lost revenue because we're not collecting taxes. Um, and so that to me, that is where we need to put, um, you know, a lot of money and a lot of effort to increase our tax base and not worry so much about, you know, just the core areas. Um, so my other question was um, about the, um, the housing typology and maybe commissioner, this is for you. Um, I'm looking at the website for the housing typology. So it has the indicators that make up the housing typology and that is median sales price, um, that is uh, sales variance, um, foreclosures as a percentage of sales, and that's, I'm assuming, mortgage foreclosures, correct? Yeah, not tax sale, mortgage foreclosures. Um, percentage of land uh, that's vacant um, or is a vacant lot, um, owner-occupied percentage, residential properties uh, in terms of the, uh, with. Um, greater than $10,000 worth of permits for rehab um, and housing units per acre. Um, in your sort of new analysis that you're starting to do with the, um, uh, the um, housing, comprehensive housing plan and all of that, are you um, look, gonna be looking at these indicators again? Because, um, you know, I think that uh, the one thing that I see missing here is um, you know, cost of rent, which is significantly high, um, and that that could um, factor into how we want to, what tools we want to use in those neighborhoods. So the um, housing market typology is uh, done in partnership with TRF and the components. So um, I will go back to the team and talk to them about the um, percentage of rent as, as part of that and looking at where that fits within the update. And, and the councilwoman and I had a conversation about this in terms of what other things we might want to consider, you know, moving forward um, as well. I mean, while we're at it, <laughs> we can, you know, start to work on that um, as well. Um, and I think that that's pretty much it, but I uh, want to just emphasize that, um, you know, I, I, I'm not sure that um, sort of stopping this program at year five um, and then doing an assessment, um, you know, makes makes sense. I think we need to have a uh, an assessment period where we're doing this evaluation, but that you know we can make any changes um, at that time. So um, I have more to say, but I'll pass it along. Mr. Chair, sure. Uh, question for the sponsor. Um, I was just thinking about this, and I'm not sure if this has been something that we've considered in light of the concerns. You need to get closer to You're the You're speaking mic. to the mic? Sure, let me just hold it. Um, the question for the sponsor regarding, um, I was just kind of thinking about this is, is um, I was trying to untangle some of the concerns brought forward by, by the finance department. Um, because we have two bills here, one that seems to uh, require inclusionary housing and then the other that aims to incentivize inclusionary housing, what if, or, or have we considered perhaps um, requiring it in the core and strong uh, parts of the city um, for the housing market typology and incentivizing it all across the city? Would that, would that be a way to make sure that we don't overburden some of our um, neighborhoods that don't have the activity that we're looking for? So um, I appreciate that question, thank you. Um, the word incentivize is not what we're using in the tax credit, it's actually a way to pay for the gap between the market rent and the, um, the rent that would be get uh, from 60% from of AMI. Um, so it's, it's a requirement and then they would get the tax credit. So it's not like it's, you know, if you do affordability, if you do inclusionary, then you will get the credit. It's, it's, you're doing inclusionary because you are already a building that's getting subsidy and you're gonna get a tax credit. But the, so just to your other question about sort of geography, um, the, the enterprise report is pretty clear that, um, you know, even in the core areas that there has to be something there. So that having the requirement be citywide and then have the tax credit in outside of the strong markets um, and core markets, that's certainly something to put into the mix of the discussions. Um, I would um, imagine that um, the development community is not necessarily gonna be happy about that, but that um, the, 
tax credit itself, you know, can be um, utilized in other in other places. That's something that we can certainly consider, but that has not been part of the discussion. And I want to po pose the same question to um, finance: if that still sufficiently addresses the concerns that you brought forward, if we structured it that way. I, I would say not not quite because. Um, you know, what the, the fear would be, in the current models, we're seeing, again, most of the development, all the development in the recent years happening in the core and the strong. Um, but, you know, we want to, you know, we want to allow for additional development in some of those other areas. And the enterprise report says you're not going to get market right there now, but we, we certainly want to in the future. So um, we, I'd have to think about that and run some scenarios. Um, but right right now, it's fair to say that the like the models we're running, we're only seeing the market rate stuff happen in those in those areas, and so it might not be that much of a difference in the short term because if there's nothing else happening market rate again in those other areas, you wouldn't have additional subsidy. Um, I know we do have fears about having a citywide requirement overall, just because of that potential impact that it could, um, you know, if we see some development happening in some of those other areas outside of core and strong, you know, a crime a requirement like this. Um, you know, could scare some of that away. I, you know, I don't know if Alice, if you have any other thoughts on that or. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any additional questions or concerns? Uh, Councilman Dorsey. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I just want to raise my concerns about the idea of limiting uh, the credit to uh, these uh, core and strong market areas. Uh, I represent a not core, not strong market area, but uh, a middle neighborhood area, um, which is really, really important uh, as an area f for people to have more opportunity to live, right? Um, at its core, affirmatively furthering fair housing is about creating opportunity for people to move to areas of opportunity. And focusing on core and strong areas seems to me to be an effort to make only the longest, farthest, most difficult leap from what we already have, which is developing affordable housing in the lowest income, lowest market areas in the city. And so it seems to me to make just too much sense to allow for greater incentive in the areas that are kind of the next near kind of step uh, into middle market areas. And it seems to me that there's a financial incentive for the city to do so when I look at areas like, like what I represent. If I, if I think about, you know, when I think about my district, I think about the Morgan State campus and the neighborhoods that are immediately to the west of Morgan, which are just homogeneously row homes um, with really no other room for anything else to be built. <coughs> There's no commercial corridor along Hill. And then I think about the Harford Road corridor. And this is a corridor that, like, despite there being like 1% vacancy in all of the neighborhoods along the, say, like three, three and a half miles of Harford Road that I represent, there's like 70% underutilization of the commercial corridor. And if you look by any comparison uh, between, say, even the lowest uh, income neighborhoods in the city, the, the highest rates of blight in the city have a higher tax yield than like the most commonplace gas station on Harford Road or big old underutilization of property along the commercial corridor. Essentially, any incentive to redevelop those commercial corridor sites into anything other than what they are today that's of any higher use at all is a net tax gain for the city, right? Even if we have to give away a little bit of tax uh, credit in order to help incentivize something there, um, it's it's got to be a net tax gain to turn any of the you know, countless vacancies or car-oriented properties that are yielding the lowest possible tax yield for the city to any any 
any incentive to see those redeveloped has to net a tax gain for the city and in the process um, create opportunity for people to move to areas of opportunity. And so I just wanna, I want that clearly in everybody's mind as there's any conversation about constraining a tax credit to areas that exclude middle neighborhoods. Yeah, and I, I would just, res one, one quick response that the high performance market rate tax credit, not the one we're talking about tonight to, on, on the inclusionary, but the, 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 the high performance market rate tax credit is available citywide. And so, you know, with these restrictions we're talking about, what we don't want to have happen is in neighborhoods like that, we don't want to create additional restrictions to prevent you know, market rate development from happening in those areas. And like I said, that we're only seeing, you know, development of these bigger multifamily projects in the core and the strong. And so that, that tax credit is available in other markets. And like I said, we have seen it expand quite a bit. I mean, in the early stages, you were just in this very narrow area right around downtown and harbor adjacent neighborhoods, basically. And slowly over time, you know, we have seen some development open up in some other areas that have been a you know pleasant surprise for the city. And so that, we, ta that tax credit would be available um, for any development citywide if it can happen. The, the issue with the restrictions is just making sure that we don't, that we don't make it harder in those areas, unnecessarily harder in those areas where we have the potential um, to see some, some, some development. But we are seeing development in, like along the Harford Road corridor. We are seeing development already and it's not going to be inclusive. And that's the issue. We're going to see a project with 150 or 160 new units. Um, it, we're going to see another project with 86 units. We just had a project a couple of years ago come online with 11. We're about to see another with 22 units. We've got a lot of projects coming online in, these, in this middle market area. And, and the, the rents that are being asked right now in those areas are already 80% AMI. So creating the tax credit that would allow the small leap from having all of them at 80% AMI to having just some of them at 60% AMI, that's a really, really small difference to be made up that we could do, I think, that's totally in the cards um, if we don't miss the opportunity to create it. I just I think that these middle market areas are the most important place for us to be creating this new opportunity. You finished. Thank, thank you, uh, uh, Councilman. Uh, we're going to go to the testimony. I think Bob, uh, we've heard a couple different uh, points, um, and just to provide uh, any clarifying comments on this. It appears that what we're saying is uh, the city's concern, the administration is concerned that by providing incentives in areas that already aren't receiving market rate developments, that providing these incentives in those areas could spur market rate development and ultimately drive more pressure from a revenue loss of the city perspective. Is that right? Yeah, so I would say, again, that the high performance market tax credit, is, it is available everywhere. That's but we're the, not really seeing any units yeah, produced we're, in those areas, We're correct? not seeing much produced. Yeah. Like I said, we've seen, you know, including in, in Councilman Dorsey's district, we've seen some, you know, smaller developments, um, not the massive kind of like 500 unit developments, but we've seen some projects go up. And again, our, our fear is just making sure that by putting any restrictions, you know, requirements on outside of the core and the strong we don't want to we, we don't we don't want to jeopardize those projects and um, you know from a tax stand, revenue standpoint we don't want to jeopardize a good project like that totally understand the idea of wanting to have inclusionary in those areas uh, or some requirement but we're just being you know cautious and making sure that we don't stop that development because we do want those projects to continue gotcha so so I'm clear the argument there for the neighborhoods outside of the core is not one based off of uh, uh, being fiscally responsible for the city from a revenue perspective, it's more or less you want to ensure that we don't artificially uh, limit growth in those areas with this policy. Is that right? Yes, and that and there would be. I think a that's a, okay. I think that's a really important point for everybody to to focus on. I don't want to conflate the two issues. Um, I think the potential loss from a revenue perspective, as it relates to 
um, what the market can actually bear um, is more um, um, uh, specific to the core and stronger communities uh, from a revenue perspective. I, I think the issue that we're hearing from the administration and finance regarding the areas outside of the core and strong is more or less ensuring that even though we haven't seen development, we don't want to artificially get ahead and limit development in the future. So I think that those are the two uh, points of challenge that uh, it will be important for us to evaluate as we continue to move forward. So I just wanted to make sure that we're all on the same page and we didn't conflate those two as to one. At this time, I don't believe there are any additional questions or comments from the council. We're going to turn it over uh, to testimony. Um, first up, I have um, uh, Dick Mankin. Thank you, Council President and um, Councilwoman uh, Ramos and um, other council members. Um, I am representing my partner, Douglas Schmidt, who has two other community meetings at the present time. So I am reading this report um, under his name. As a Baltimore City real estate developer and advocate for city growth and revitalization, I have been grateful to lend my knowledge and experience to the effort to create a new inclusionary housing program. After hearing both the desires of housing advocates, the concerns of DHCD and the Finance Department, and the realities of the Baltimore City economy and real estate market, the ultimate policy choice must balance, one, desire to expand mixed income opportunities in successful neighborhoods, two, goal to offer life trajectory changing opportunities for low-income Baltimoreans. Three, recognition that there are many social service desires and Baltimore City discretionary funding is limited. Four, understanding the need for a do-no-harm approach to a relatively unproductive housing and apartment market in Baltimore City. An inclusionary law crafted to satisfy all these factors is entirely possible and within reach. The bill as currently proposed falls short and more work is required. We remain committed to a positive outcome that is a major improvement over the old law, one that produces inclusionary housing units. In reference to tax credits in general and the credits proposed in the proposed bill, there continue to be misconceptions that it can have confused the inclusionary housing policy process. The unfortunate truth is that Baltimore's double tax rate is somewhat mitigated by a myriad of 10-year tax discount programs. There is no unused subsidy that can be applied to pay for inclusionary units. The cost of inclusionary units, if borne by projects, would make development impossible. We appreciate that policymakers largely recognize this reality. We will continue to provide financial modeling to assess the impact of every scenario offered, considering the AMI levels, affordability term, and the alternate credit structures to offset the cost. Additionally, there are issues related to the applicability, the oversight board, and the inclusionary housing compliance process, which are impractical as proposed. We continue to offer adjustments that will make the ultimate law work better in practice. It is not as if our industry is not doing its part already. Please consider that it is largely commercial real estate owners, buyers and sellers who are supporting the Affordable Housing Trust Fund through the establishment of the yield tax. This widened the city's lead as the most expensive jurisdiction in the state to complete a real estate transaction. Its impact, along with other challenges, contributed to Baltimore being listed number three out of 50 cities as having the greatest barriers to apartment development by the National Multifamily Housing Council. Many of Baltimore's neighbors, neighborhoods offer a world-class urban living experience. It is only in these areas and along their edges where new development can hope to find an income and expense condition that will produce financial returns to attract private capital. These returns must be as high or higher than projects in competing cities, Washington, Philadelphia, Nashville, Raleigh, Durham, and others. 
The opposite of a disinvestment is investment, and we work to bring private investment to Baltimore in every location it is feasible. It is possible to expand the areas where market rate development can occur, but it can only happen with an improved business and cl a climate that encourages people to choose Baltimore to live, work, and shop. The right inclusionary has housing program can allow more Baltimoreans to experience Baltimore's best without further crimping investment by the industry and the city government. In addition, I'd like to point out that currently we have on the drawing boards over 1,000 units that will not be built in 2023 or 2024 because the economics don't work based on the capital structures that currently exist with the cost of debt that's in place. So when, um, Bob, when you do your future projections, look at 2024, 2025, and 2026 with less units. Thank you very much, Council President. Thank you. Um, Mr. Mannequin, if you could get the uh, committee that report. I couldn't find it online. Give it out to the committee. No, not your, uh, the uh, National Multifamily. You, you quote it. Uh, three. I will get that report. Yeah, if you could get us sure. that report. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Uh, thank you. Next up, we have uh, the illustrious Miss Sonia Eady. Is she? I don't see her. Oh, she's in the back. Good evening. Good evening. I wasn't quite ready for this one. <laughs> Um, so, I'm Sonia Eady, and thank you for this opportunity to be present here tonight. I'm speaking on the behalf of my city. I am in support of this inclusionary housing bill. There are some exceptions that I would like to see, and I thank you, um, Odette um, Ramos, for to bring this here. So some of this I said before at one of the hearings, and but I want to repeat it. Black families living in Baltimore City, we weren't the property owners. Remember there was a red line. There was a great white flight. The system helped create the slums in our neighborhoods. They pulled all the investment out of our neighborhoods. 50 years later, whites and those who could not afford to leave want to come back home. Well, they gave up their homes, not wanting to live with us. Now they're trying to come back and still not wanting to live with us. It's evident with the high rents and high um, housing costs. A person could own a $100,000 to $300,000 home with what they're paying for rent. Why is there a battle over what our address is? Baltimore City caused blight, we have survived the ruins. When we cannot and shall not be excluded, if it was not for us, there would not be jobs for you today. We were your tax base. Overcharged with no results. There were high rise projects, buildings across the city, families caged in like animals. We all, Wait a minute. This has become a, a HUD practice. This is what we see as the future of our black neighborhoods for working class blacks, both low and moderate incomes. With that said, we should learn from the past and not repeat it. I am expecting you to stop dumping these units in our neighborhoods. You don't want them in yours. You build condominiums for yours. Our property values are decreasing because of these housing complexes, forcing our neighborhoods to become transient. Let's help eradicate dependency and density. Give us the same investments that you put in yon. The city is allowing the development of high-rise buildings hidden behind the concept of luxury apartments in our neighborhoods. The developers are receiving TIF bonds that we, the taxpayers, will have to pay back. And on top of that, we cannot even afford to rent there. 
Rents are averaging 1,600 for an efficiency to 3,000 for a three bedroom. They tore out our homes and small businesses and built something that, we, that does not provide the same living opportunities. Um, invest money in our black neighborhoods that will increase the value of le legacy homeowners' properties. Black families once lived throughout Baltimore City, Federal Hill, Reservoir Hill, Waverly, to name a few. I am expecting this administration to impute policies that development, developers and investors will have to keep, excuse me, housing rents and sales in equal unit sizes available throughout the city, not just targeted neighborhoods. A policy that will retain the legacy city resident, retirees, homeowners, and who may want to transit to apartment living, their children and grandchildren who want to rent or purchase to remain city taxpayer residents. A policy that will stop the new redlining, the exclusion of an affordability in predominantly influential and white neighborhoods. This is how I see true inclusion, diversity, and choice neighborhoods are created. Abolish gentrification in Baltimore City. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next up I see um, Nathan Tarter. Mr. Tarter, you have uh, two minutes. Thank you very much. Um, I'll take much less than two minutes of your time. Uh, my name is Nathan Tarter. I'm here for the first time in um, the this hall, and um, I put my name to speak because I feel very, I feel very strongly about this issue because I want to live in a city that has inclusionary housing as part of its ethos. And inclusionary housing is what Baltimore City should be about because Baltimore City is about working class families. Working class families built this city and they need to stay here. We all have pressures on us to leave. Everyone in this room. We also have invitations to stay. Many of us have more pressures to leave than to stay, than invitations to stay, and that's why we leave. And I'm ready to leave this city unless inclusionary housing at 60% AMI for the percentages of people across this city have to stay. And that's an invitation for me to stay, and I invite this body to pass that. I also invite the developers in this room and listening to understand that this is a human issue. This is not a financial issue. I'm coming before you to represent those that have way more pressures to leave than to stay, and to ask you to please invite us back. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, I think is uh, Ms. Seltzer from Liberty Square. It's about the f the first bill. Yeah, you can you can come up and. and it's the one that's not inclusionary. Both bills are inclusionary. Oh, okay. One is uh, the bill that, to implement the, the, the policy. The other is a bill to provide a tax incentive or I don't want to say incentive, but a, a, a tax credit uh, to reimburse the bill. Okay. Hi, my name is Shia Seltzer. I live in Liberty Square. Um, there's shelter, and then there's business, and then there's commercial, which is also business. Why are the, yeah, are the business, the rentals, the same tax rate as the shelters? The same houses side by side. I live in Liberty Square, 74% renters. Um, um, I, um, uh, May 2nd, you had a interesting thing here at 2 p.m., which it's not like a lot of people could really come at 2 p.m. 
where, where you've made houses 1973 and older, um, suddenly they're historical. And, um, and I looked at the lines and they're, it's now black lining. In this room, Councilman West, uh, they decided to red line, and now we have black line. It's whereas people can have huge conglomerates and not pay any taxes for 10 years. And I looked at it, I'm like, I'm on the line here. I'm actually right on the black line. And I looked closer and closer, or oh, maybe I'm not. Maybe I'm not part of that but it's part of the Liberty Square. But the part that definitely is, is on Rice's Town Road, where all the apartment complexes are. So, <clears throat> you, you, congratulations. You have done a great job that, that uh, Councilman West never even thought of, that people should pay different rates, tax rates. The tax rates, the backbone of the money to run the city, and you're bankrupting Baltimore. You are sending it the course to receivership even quicker. I proposed uh, uh, over a year ago for Baltimore to have reparations, to use the 15,000 houses for reparations, which wouldn't just be for reparations, but to be inclusionary, you know, with a lot of people, to use, to use uh, Habitat for Humanity International. We could get the, every single house be um, homeowners in three years. Um, I'm hurting. I live in $914. Um, my food stamps were slashed to $64 a month. I'm working, working my damn, excuse me. I'm working diligently to work to get off the system. The house, the U.S. House has decided I shouldn't get anything. I shouldn't have health care. I shouldn't have these food stamps. Um, because what is the question of how able-bodied are you supposed to be? I just want you all to know that there's some reality that people are leaving because of the crime. If people, if people love their houses, they don't care how much they pay in taxes because it's the quality of life, it's the enjoyment. Thank you, Ms. Seltzer. Next up, I see uh, Cecilia. Oh, it's still available. It's on my website still. Okay, thank you. Ms. Gonzalez. You have two minutes, ma'am. In August of 2021, a massive four alarm fire damaged multiple row homes in the 1500 block of West Fairmount Avenue and left at least 25 residents homeless. I live in Franklin Square and these were my neighbors. Our community was in touch with them and there was an outpouring of support for immediate needs such as clothes and some material needs. However, the, after the initial shock, the most pressing expressed need was affordable housing. The small alley houses that burned had been housing some legacy homeowners and a majority of families who rented at an affordable rate. And when we were trying to help them find a new place for rent, there was nothing available in our area at the affordable rates that they had been renting at. Some families had been sending their children to schools nearby and wanted to remain in the area, but nothing was available that would fit their budget. I saw a post of a rental that accepted Section 8, and I called to ask about availability, and the woman who answered the phone said to me, there is nothing in Baltimore City. You'll have better luck looking outside the city. <laughs> There was not affordable housing available for my neighbors who got displaced by the fire. We need an inclusionary housing law that protects them. We need assurance that affordable housing will be available for neighbors who need them. We need investment in people, especially those who are more vulnerable because of their lower, lower incomes. I can assure you the developers will survive. 
They will even thrive as they have continued to do in this beautiful market system that tends to benefit those who are already well resourced. Thank you. Next up, uh, Betty Bland Thomas, I believe. <laughs> she knows. Oh, you got to be consistent. Some people went over too. So we, um, just for the record, uh, a certain um, body provides discretion for certain citizens to go over two minutes. For sure. uh, and we started this with uh, openings from a one from the developer community, and then a very powerful speech by Miss Edie from uh, the neighborhood community. So just in the interest of time and to ensure that we get all questions out, as well as so we can go through the, um, the virtual uh, 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 testimony, uh, we ask folks to keep it to two minutes. For sure, for sure. And I'd say that as a joke. I'm Good evening, everyone. <laughs> what do we want? Inclusionary housing. When do we want it? We want it now. What do we want? Inclusionary housing. When do we want it? We want it now. I have seen in my community <clears throat> a slow decrease of long-term residents leaving because they can't afford it. Mm -hmm. I've also seen in my community two markets close because of this flow of gentrification. I've also seen in my community seniors who had planned to die in their community forced to have to leave their units because they could no longer afford to be there. And the factor that had caused this was with the increased gentrification of higher rented units, it increased the market values of the market value units. And so their social security checks did not increase, nor had those that are working, their wages hadn't increased to such a degree, so they had to leave. And some have left in neighborhoods where they're devastated. And I think that will have an impact on their life. I think everyone who spoke before me, because they definitely shared what is in my heart, and I don't want to take up much time, but I do want the finance department to know that inclusionary housing has been successful in other areas. You might want to check out those other areas. The picture you painted today was not that it is possible. I think we're in a room of smart people. Make it possible. Look at the possibilities. What do we want? Inclusionary housing. When do we want it? We want it now. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Blaine Thomas. Next up, we have Matt Hill. Mr. Hill, you have two minutes. Good evening, Council President Mosby. Uh, Matt Hill, Public Justice Center, members of the Council. Uh, just make two points. First, the sky will not fall if the Council acts boldly and passes these bills. Um, I remember being at this podium in 2018 with Councilman Bullock's bill that uh, created a modest surtax on high value real property transactions. And the developers, as usual, threatened repeatedly to take their toys and go elsewhere. Um, finance, too, predicted substantial declines in development and tax dollars. But this council acted boldly, and it was a modest policy in line with what other jurisdictions did. And we've seen an unprecedented boom in certain areas of the city in real estate transactions in 2021 and 2022, we've seen record property and trans transfer and recordation taxes. The, the affordable housing trust fund that was created through this process is taking in revenue far beyond anything that was predicted because the council acted boldly. The uh, inclusionary housing bills that you're considering today are the same. They're modest policies. They're in line with what other jurisdictions are doing. I'm happy to provide more details on that. and. Um, not only will developers be getting the, the current subsidies they get, the high performance, the brownfields, now they're going to get an additional 15% tax credit just for these inclusionary units. I don't see how that does not compensate the developer. It is not going to deter development. Um, and I've spoken with developers who say, look, we're not going to go public about this. We're not going to break ranks. But this is a very reasonable policy. It does not need to be watered down further in order to provide compensation. It is not going to reduce development. Um, and so the second thing I want to address is just the administration's positions around creating a, a cap on the tax credit. We strongly oppose that. I'm happy to address the 80% AMI, the citywide, too, if anyone wants to ask a question. But with my remaining 45 seconds, I just want to say that we're strongly opposed to capping the tax credit amount. 
Now, I agree with, with uh, finance that all these things are connected. That's incredibly important. Um, and the council president's been clear that we need global tax credit reform. I agree with that as well. So let's do that. Because right now, do you cap the high performance market rate tax credit that costs the city $18 million a year? No. Do you cap the brownfield tax credit that costs the city $20 million a year? No. Do you cap any of the, the other 10 tax credits that are mentioned in the city's own report from Ernst & Young? No. Even when that Ernst & Young report says that the brownfield credit is bloated and the high performance tax credit, quote, may not contribute much to the net housing supply in the city, so have you considered capping those? No. And yet, on the table, you want to give developers a blank check with those credits, but then cap the one credit that's actually going to directly benefit, benefit the working class residents of Baltimore. How is that equitable? It's not. But again, it's all connected. And if the council wants to cap these and reform the tax credits on real property, they should. But you should do so in a global, connected way. And so you can pass these bills as is. Finance predicts $600,000 next year. And in the next year, you should consider a global cap or reform of all of these bloated tax credits. Um, again, happy to address the other points from this, the administration if you want. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Ms. Shaw McCready. After Ms. McCready, we have Ms. Ericat from 1199. Uh, thank you, City Council President and City Council members for the opportunity to testify. My name is Sharmetta Shar McCready, and I'm the Executive Director of Communities Planning and Housing Association, formerly known as Citizens Planning and Housing Association, or CPHA. I'm also one of many leaders representing Baltimore's Inclusionary Housing Coalition a coalition of 20 plus community and nonprofit organizations representing all of Baltimore City. The Inclusionary Housing Coalition, coalition or the IHC, has been operating in good faith throughout this entire process. CPHA, as well as IHC, supports the Bill 23-0369, the High Performance Inclusionary Tax Credit Bill. Bill 230369 is created to finance the companion bill 22-0195. CPHA, the IHC, and experts believe equity is the pathway to prosperity. This is also true for Baltimore City. Structural racism disproportionately harms and the health and livelihoods of BIPOC, which is blacks, indigenous people of color, and marginalized communities nationwide and here in the city. The companion housing bills are a way to encourage mixed income and to address structural racism um, uh, in Baltimore. According to the National Equity Atlas, between 2010 and 2019, 39% of Baltimore City's population has seen much of its population um, growth from people of color. However, sadly, income inequality continues to rise. In 2020, the median house, uh, household income in Baltimore City was between $50,400 and $65,000. That's 60% AMI. The median household income in the Baltimore Columbia Towson MSA is about $83,811. That's 80% AMI. Uh, the median wage for workers of color in the city is $19 compared to $28 for its white workers. An effective inclusionary housing bill makes dollars and cents. An effective inclusionary housing bill and tax credit bill will help increase the supply of affordable housing. The tax credit can make developing these affordable housing units more financially feasible and less reliant on public subsidy through cross-subsidization. An inclusionary housing law and tax credit can help create a safe, healthy and sustainable living environment for families. This tax credit allows the inclusionary units. Financing these units helps deconcentrate poverty and promote racial and socioeconomic integration. At the same time, high concentrations of poverty are associated with adverse child and family outcomes. This is from the National Housing Conference, especially when we start talking about, you know, financing education. Mixed income communities foster economic development and can lead to higher uh, property values, better schools, 
improve access to transportation and retail options. Inclusionary housing affirmatively furthers fair housing. It, inclusionary um, housing also decreases gentrification and displacement. The inclusionary house, house um, excuse me, housing tax credit and inclusionary housing bill, um, if not prohibited by politics or an administration, is a win for all parties involved. It is a win for Baltimore City. It's an opportunity to make a statement that all are welcome in Baltimore, especially middle and low income families. Baltimore can be a model and increase its population. We can have a legacy here. Let's change the narrative and start looking at how the passage of this bill can build healthier neighborhoods in Baltimore City. Thank you. Next up, Ms. Erica from 1199. After that, we have Ms. Sharonda Huffman. Good evening, Council. My name is Lorraine Arcad. I'm with 1199 SCIU. We are proud members of the Inclusionary Housing Coalition. Affordable housing is worker justice. While we are giving millions to developers, our city is failing its low-income workers. Instead of subsidizing luxury living, let's pass the city's first tax credit for creating affordable units. We know that despite fighting for higher wages, we are never matching the skyrocketing cost of living. According to a National Low-Income Housing Coalition report published this past August, one would need to work 93 hours per week at a rate of 28.93 per hour to afford a two-bedroom rental apartment in Maryland. SEIU represents 5,000 members here in Baltimore City. Our members, who are often overworked and underpaid, are predominantly women of color. Not only are our members burnt out and ready to leave their jobs, they're also talking about leaving the city. They come home to neighborhood, neighborhoods in which they worry about paying their bills, educational equity, public safety, and keeping a roof over their heads. Inclusionary housing means racial and gender equity for our essential workers who deserve to live and work without the fear of being priced out. Affordable housing is also health care. Effective inclusionary housing policy is about building thriving, healthy communities. Our Baltimore City members work at premier medical institutions in the city like Johns Hopkins, University of Maryland, Chase Brexton, as well as long-term care facilities serving our most vulnerable. Yet these very institutions have patients and low-income workers alike who struggle to pay rent and experience homelessness. Council Bill 230369 is about making it possible for Baltimore City to have hundreds more affordable units. Inclusionary housing is key to mitigating displacement in neighborhoods as this market strengthens in areas with high vacancy and a soft market. Inclusionary housing, both 220195 and 230369, Baltimore has a chance to break with inequitable development practices that subsidize segregation and create a more equitable and integrated community. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Erica. <laughs> Next up, Ms. Huffman. Good, e Good evening. My name is Sharonda Huffman. I am uh, the Housing Director of Maryland Inclusive Housing. And I want to um, thank this honorable um, City Council for the opportunity to speak. Um, I'm, I, am, I have a few questions. I've listened to this testimony, and I, I'm going to ask the uh, City Council to ask the mayor's administration, do they actually want inclusionary housing? If so, how is the administration moving forward into the reality of having inclusive housing for even very low income residents. My clients I serve have disabilities and their only income might be social security, which is at 15% of the adjusted medium income. Um, and also I have a question. I, I looked at the finance report and does the finance report reflect equity? I hear numbers and I don't hear people. And I hear that we're supposed to end homelessness. Well, how do you end homelessness if you don't have affordable units? Does the mayor's administration have a plan for a better financial outlook? I just attended a conference in Montgomery County. It wasn't just the person who's in charge of housing speaking, it was the actual county executive. And they had initiatives that there was actual funding from the county to pay for affordable housing, not only for 60% AMI, but even people for very low income. 
they take, they take their own tax money to make sure they take care of their citizens. And what I also want to reflect, um, today or yesterday, I tried to help a person with a disability actually provide testimony for this. Couldn't even find the bill. So that's just something to um, think about. So I don't know if there's other people that wanted to provide testimony written, but they can't. So how are we going to move forward? What is the vision for workforce and mixed income housing? Um, I just want to make sure that we take in consideration those people with very low income. Um, just like uh, Councilman Glover, I attended the uh, grant um, public hearing from Department of Housing and Community Development, and my questions were the same. I used to work in housing and community development, and it seems like the grant programs are the same thing. We keep redoing the same thing over and over again. How are we going to get different results? How are we promoting equity? And i just like the, the council to ask those questions. Thank you very much, and I appreciate if the city would pass um, the uh, laws and also include um, uh, persons with disabilities and very low income. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Ms. Diane Blevins. Ms. Diane Blevins. Good evening. My name is Diane Blevins, and I am a current resident with a disability. I support the I support Bill twenty three oh oh three sixty nine if it's allowed more housing for people with disabilities. I also serve on the Mayor's Commission on Disabilities. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Next up we have Marvin Briscoe. Good evening. I'm sorry, ma'am. Are you you Miss Robin? Yes, yes we together. we're together. Okay. We're just that's that's totally fine. So okay. uh, you guys will have your own individual time to speak, but you can okay. stay together. Ladies first. Is that what we're saying? Okay. So that's I guess how, I'll go first. That's how I was raised too. I get it. <laughs> it is no secret, based on our shirts, that we would like to save. It is no secret, based on our shirts, that we would like to save Grove Park. Good evening, Mr. Council President and members of the council. Um, we love Baltimore, and more importantly, we love our beloved Grove Park. We're here to find out, and I'm hearing a common theme throughout this evening's testimonies. We are here to find out what the community's options are when it comes to replacing Grove Park Elementary School. While the idea of CommuniCare is what you are suggesting we don't want it. The concern is the equity to the neighborhood, the commercialization, the increase in traffic and the noise, and losing the authenticity of the neighborhood. I am a five decade, nearly six decade resident of Grove Park. It's the first and only home that my parents ever purchased and I am fortunate to still have it. Most residents in the area are either longtime residents, legacy, or for our newer residents, they took a drive through a quiet neighborhood and with a lot of greenery and decided to call and make Grove Park their home. Perhaps inclusionary housing could be an option. I just, we, because there are people here, we just don't think that CommuniCare is the way. Tossing it to you. I'm the newer member of Grove Park. I moved there a year ago, and I, I love it. I love Baltimore, graduated from Holland Park, Carver, Morgan State, Coppin, Union Baptist Church. I'm Baltimore, you really think about it. I like Grove Park. I don't have any complaints. We don't have complaints about DPW. We don't have rodents. We keep our community clean. Even if it's not the mayor cleanup, we're gonna keep it clean. Mm -hmm. It's 97% black. We like to keep it that way. And I was listening to your testimony. I grew up in, in Sandtown. There's plenty of room in Sandtown to build a hospital, and they need 200 jobs there. So let's look in these areas where they need jobs. 
need where vacant houses are, Holland Park, Emerson Avenue. I know the city very well. Put it in places where it needed. And they need some jobs down there. We like our community. We don't, we don't need our spiller. Equity, come to people. Let's talk about equity and housing. It's giving your community what it needs. We don't need a lot of things. Equity. You moving people out to move that hospital in, that's not equity. Those people are older than me, and I'm 63. They say, you got to move. They receive letters. You have to move. How do you tell 80-year-old you have to move when they live there all their lives? How do you do that? That's not equity. It's not just with people. It's with communities, too. If 97% black, we want to keep it that way, it's strong. We clean up everything. We take care of each other. My neighborhood is sitting up here. We all close. We talk. Mr. Bristow, Ms. Briscoe and uh, Ms. Pettiford, how is it germane to this particular topic we're on today? How, how is this uh, relevant to this topic that we're talking about yep. today? Because we felt that our taxes would be affected um, when the hospital moved in our neighborhood. We, we, this has a lot to do, we're talking about keeping customers, keeping residents here, Baltimore population declining. I want to be empowered. I want my voice to count. So I, I, I pay taxes, a lot of it, but I don't worry, I don't bother anybody about it. But give me a voice too, so not just I, my money. So what I'm hearing is you, you think that there's other sensible solutions from a development perspective that would increase the strength of your neighborhood. That's yes. why you're here to testify. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just for the Council on Public's edification, uh, the Grove Park community, um, some members are protesting uh, the decision uh, to sell the former school uh, to a private institution for uh, a practice. So that's in front of the Ways and Means Committee. Uh, it's not specific to this bill, however, they think that this bill, as it relates to talk about housing and development, is directly related to that topic. So. That's why uh, we took your testimony today. Thank you. Um, next up, Ms. Claudia Wilson. Good, meeting, good evening, um, members of the City Council. My name is Claudia Wilson Randall. I'm the Executive Director of the Community Development Network of Maryland. Um, I'm going to be brief. Um, I am here in support of inclusionary housing um, and part of the inclusionary housing coalition um, with my colleagues. Just want to <coughs> echo some of the things that they said. Um, and I also want to focus on what the cost of continuing the policies that we've had in the city of Baltimore, or, or what's the cost of the status quo or doing nothing. Um, Housing discrimination is connected with all of the city's most urgent ills. Violence, education, economic development, health. I'm hearing over and over that we can't afford to do this. I don't think we can afford not to do this. Is there a plan for this city to be a thriving place with a healthy tax base? We go through discrimination, discrimination lawsuits, loss of federal funding. When do we change the investment strategy for housing? We're talking about 10%, not 20%, but 10% of the units. I think this is a reasonable compromise. And we need an investment strategy that includes children and households making less than $50,000 a year, including people who work for the city of Baltimore. City workers with high blood pressure, diabetes, and disabilities. Your mothers who, and aunties who are on SSI and SSDI. When do we start making a city that is for them when, and for us. And when do we start building for opportunity for the next generation of children in Baltimore? I am in 
favor of the inclusionary zoning and the high performance tax credits that go with it in order for it to make, make it happen. But we need to see progress on this issue and we need to see change. So with that, I thank you and uh, I, I look forward to change in our housing investment strategy in the city of Baltimore. With that, Mr. Green, if we could turn uh, to the members of the public who are online. Um, if you could uh, denote that you're interested uh, for the folks that are joining us via computer by raising your hand, uh, we will use the raise hand function. We will call on you that way. He raises his hand. Uh, first up, we have Mr. Charlie Duff. Mr. Duff, the floor is yours. I'm so sorry. Before we go into virtual, it appears that we're missing. Let me see how it looks again. We might be missing someone. Come on up. I'm so sorry. What's your name, ma'am? Argentine Saunders Craig. I don't see you on the list, but I that does not matter. List, but I com communicated with every It doesn't matter. You're going to still speak to us today. Uh -huh. Thank you. All right. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Yes. Loud and clear. All right. Good. <laughs> Gentlemen and gentle ladies of the Baltimore City Council, my name is Argentine Saunders Craig, and I'm a member of the League of Women Voters, Baltimore City and a member of the L Inclusionary Housing Coalition. I testify in support of CB 023-0389. In so doing, I appeal to your futuristic vision of democracy for economic and social justice for the people of Baltimore City. I know and believe that when we raise our consciousness to a leadership liminal level, we act for the people and for the city. At that level, we seize the opportunity to change the housing inequities that have existed too long in perpetuating segregation and divisions in our city. Today, I come with hope. I hope that each of you, as 14 city council leaders, will make the decision to resolve competing demands from multiple sources on a creative, humanistic, and consciousness level and vote for the Inclusionary Housing's Companion Bill, CB 023-0369. I thank you for listening, and I want you to remember that principles developed in liminal consciousness and unity in diversity, equality, humanity, empathy, kindness, and love in a state of transcendence. I'm asking you to leap over hard facts and figures and remember who and what kind of city we want to have for ourselves, our children, and our great-grandchildren. I am a great-grandmother, and I want us to be him or her, her, actually, she's a girl, to live in this city where she feels safe, secure, happy, and productive. And I lay on you that responsibility and hope you join with your colleagues and those who are assembled here today to make that happen. You can do it. You can do it. Thank you. Thank you. Now we're going to turn over to uh, the virtual attendees.
First up, are we going to go to Mr. Duff, or he's gone? He, he's gone. Um, again, please use the raise hand function. Do we have any takers? I see Ms. Mara Taylor. First up, Ms. Mara Taylor, we're going to unmute you. Please state your name and begin your testimony. You have two minutes. Ms. Taylor. My name is Mara Taylor. I am a resident of Canton. I am here um, on behalf of the Canton Community Association, on which I serve on the Board of Directors. The Board of Directors voted last week to support this legislation, which we feel is critical. Um, we strongly believe in the need for inclusionary housing in Baltimore City, particularly as we are seeing less and less even affordable housing in Canton. Affordable meaning you have to make way more than 60% of AMI to currently live in the Canton community. So we are boxing out current residents and longtime residents. And we want to stop any further gentrification and wholeheartedly urge support for this legislation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, are there any additional uh, folks online that would like to speak? Again, please raise, use the raise hand function at the bottom of your screen. I think we have a couple of people that have joined us via phone. If we could go through and unmute them person by person. All right, I, at this time, um, are there any additional questions or concerns from members of the council? Uh, hearing and seeing none, any parting words from members of the administration? Uh, at this time, uh, Madam Sponsor, would you like to close us out? Sure. Um, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, colleagues, uh, for uh, being here and um, staying the whole time. Thank you so much for your great questions and your commitment to this issue. I'm, I'm really grateful for the support. Um, I want to thank um, the administration um, and also the Inclusionary Housing Coalition um, and the development community for, uh, uh, and the Council President's Office for the, um, again, hours of time that we've been spending to try to get this right. Um, and uh, I think that um, um, I'm hoping that there is a path soon. Um, we do have to pass something. Um, the, uh, the city submitted our affirmatively furthering fair housing plan um, in which it said that we have an inclusionary policy, which at the moment we do not. And so we must pass something. We want to pass something that produces units um, and that um, expresses and reflects the values um, that we have uh, basically seen from our, our residents here today. Um, and so I'm just grateful for everybody's time this evening um, and look forward to the next steps um, in getting this um, over the finish line. Uh, and this was an important hearing, I think, today to, to just, again, hear all of the pieces that need to be put together in the puzzle. Um, to, to make this work. So um, thank you, Mr. President, for um, hosting this hearing and uh, look forward to the next steps. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, with that, uh, we will adjourn this hearing. Uh, and you'll hear uh, more from us uh, in the coming weeks. Thank you.